Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hey, audience and listeners, this is James Kandasamy from Achieve Investment Group. Today is going to be a very, very interesting night uh, where we're going to be learning from uh, one of the top economists that I know and also in the industry. He's very well respected in the industry. Um, he doesn't go uh, everywhere to give his talk, but you know uh, he has uh, graciously agreed to um, give uh, you know his thoughts on where the commercial real estate outlook is going to be heading to for 2023 and beyond. And and Casey is very well connected, very highly knowledgeable, and he just know uh, his stuff, right? So before that, I just want to quickly share uh, some of my slides uh, just to introduce myself, uh, James Kandasamy from Achieve Investment Group. We always do this educational webinar series to as part of adding value to our investors and all our friends and families that we know. And if you know anybody else who will um, who will uh, benefit from our content, please make sure that they subscribe to our newsletter and uh, to our email list. So just to a few information about us, myself and my wife, Shanti, uh, we are deal sponsors focusing in Austin and San Antonio. Uh, we are operators. We have a vertically integrated company. Uh, we have done deals more than 0.5 billion until now. Um, we have sold uh, half of our assets in March, which is a perfect time for the market. Um, and you know, there is something to say about timing the market and not everybody can do it. I'm not saying I timed it perfectly, but I did read a lot of books about market cycle. Plus, you know, all the information that Casey gives me on all the market cycle. <laughs> and uh, we recently did a, a webinar with Dr. Glenn Mueller as well, who is an expert in uh, real estate market cycle. So knowledge like that really helps in making a decision on when you want to buy, when you want to dispose, right? Uh, we have owned like 4,000 units, 19 apartments. We have raised almost $65 million uh, from uh, investors. We have uh, 1,000 units uh, in class A ground up uh, development that's happening. Um, Right now, I'm going to be showing about one project in a short while. Uh, we are vertically integrated. And uh, I have two books right now, two best-selling books. And the, uh, my passive investing book uh, is a very popular book. All passive investors read it. Whether you have done 10 deals, 20 deals, you, you want to reread you want to read this book because you, know, you do not know about passive investing until you read the entire book. And that's the uh, comment that I've got from a lot of experienced passive investors. And recently I released a, a new book called Smarter Doctors, which is specifially for doctors uh, because they work really hard and they, I wanna make sure they, you know, their money works harder too. And the reason I wrote that book is very simple. I wanna make sure that it, it comes as a third party IP for them to read because doctors get bombarded with so many advertisements and uh, they just put a big wall around them when people, uh, there's you know, new content or new asset class being introduced to them. And we also have a multifamily investors group in Facebook, which you can come and join. You'll see a lot of uh, me in there. And just one final slide is, uh, we got a historic milestone on our company. Achieve, uh, started our first development, uh, which is 15 acres, 324 units in San Antonio. We just broke ground last month. This picture was taken uh, last week. So we can see all the uh, big, uh, clearing happening by the, you know, by the contractors. So with that, I'm going to be passing the uh, uh, the host to Casey. Let me make sure, Casey, I'm going to make you host. And Casey, it's your turn right now. All right. I'll put my slides up here. Let's see if I can find them real quick. Yeah. And we'll be doing webinar format and we'll doing podcast format. So, you know, if you are in my if you're listening to my podcast called Achieve Wealth, you can listen to this podcast as well. And we'll do a QA uh, as we move along. And I'll monitor the QA uh, box as well. If you have any questions from the attendees, uh, please make sure you put your questions in the QA and I can I can uh, shoot it to Casey and we can also ask questions at the end. So 
Go ahead, Casey. It's, it's all yours. Great. It's always great to be with you and your audience. And thank you for all that you do in the industry and help mentoring you know younger agents and investors and and keeping them from being eaten by the alligators. I'll I'll share with you, you know, the the generations of my hair through the different cycles. This is what it was before the 70s and 80s, you know, nice and full and thick, and you see what's happened to it now. Um, I do have my red shoes. Since this is an evening one, these are my red suede shoes I brought just for you tonight. Uh, these these are my daytime running shoes to run from the bed. <laughs> so, yeah. um, we can see your slides right now, Casey. You can't see them? Uh, no, I can see your slides, yes. Okay, great. So um, anyway, you'll see I've got the hot air balloon. Uh see if it will let me advance so i was out in uh, new mexico uh, albuquerque a few weeks ago and you know i'd forgotten they have a hot air balloon festival out there and so when i got out there i was all excited i thought i found inflation for the fed all these inflating balloons then the, then a storm came over and lightning hit one of them and you know there's the deflating economy <laughs> so i found inflation and deflation in the same the same thing so here's my disclaimer to protect you jame your investors and um and achieve properties uh, we'll jump right in. I'm, I broke this into two groups of five. So here on slide three, kind of the, I'm going to give you the top 10 items that I'm kind of focused on and I'm sharing with people. And these are kind of the first five and we'll peel them back like an onion layer, layer and get down into this thing. Uh, feel free to interrupt me along the way, James. So, or if you see any questions, we can stop. So these first five are obviously the Federal Reserve, then the key inflation metrics, which one's more meaningful than others. The three confidence measures, because a lot of our economy and investing is psychological. So if the consumer and small business and housing are all depressed and on meds, uh, we, we don't have much of an economy. Uh, the re, you know the coming recession, I believe, we're already in it. Um, we'll be in a recession full next year. Um, the, the Fed, like they they couldn't find inflation, then it was transitory, then it wasn't transitory. You know they're not going to know when they've overdone it. They're going to put this thing in the ditch and destroy their second mandate. So we call it the misery index. Steve Forbes actually created it for Jimmy Carter back in the 70s and he's updated it. We'll talk a little about that. And then there's an index that I helped co-produce with the CCI Institute called CREPI, the Commercial Real Estate Property Index. And so it's free. You can get to it. You can send it to your clients. We'll talk a little bit about that. So let's go into these five. So this was a good piece in the Bloomberg a week or 10 days ago. Uh, Roy had Jim Bullard. If you want to know what's going to happen in the Fed, look at the battle between Jay Powell, the chair, and Jim Bullard, Jim Bullard from the St. Louis Fed, the president of St. Louis Fed, he's been the only credible entity uh, on inflation going back two years. And he told them they should get on it. And they ignored him. And uh, so he really, in this Bloomberg piece, said, look, at forget getting to 5%. So if we get a set, another 75 basis point rate hike on December 14th here in a week, um, then we'll be just under 5% on the Fed's uh, overnight rate, funds rate. And Jim Bullard says, no, we got to go to 7% to really kill this thing. So just imagine a 7% Fed funds rate and what your interest rates are. So my big macro concern here for all of us is the fundamentals, particularly multifamily and industrial, are very much intact. But the problem is we're going to see capital completely choked off because what the Fed is essentially telling the banks is lending is inflationary. So quit lending. So we're choking off all of our capital. So that's what we're going to have to be vigilant on, look for creative ways to bring either in more equity or different types of foreign investors or friends and family, because the banks and the big institutional investors are choking it off. Um, so that's that's really where to watch between the dynamic between Powell and, and the Fed press and the St. Louis Fed, uh, Jim Bullard. So let's talk quickly about what's going on with the jobs. Um, so when the Fed doesn't see, they want to destroy their other mandate, which is full employment. Isn't that crazy? You blew the first one. So how do you make yourself more credible? You destroy the second one. So the Fed ain't going to be happy until we're all unemployed. Uh, my survey of Americans that I know, they most of them would rather be employed with inflation than unemployed with inflation. So I, I don't get the Fed. They're not there. But, you know, we had last week the Challenger Grade Jobs Cuts Report, which comes out that Thursday before each month's uh, first Friday uh, jobs report. And it was scary, 80,000 tech job cuts, over 320,000 total job cuts. Um, you know, these are the highest totals up over 127% that we've seen since 2021. So the precursor to what the Fed wants to see is the job cuts, because when you get a job cut, you're not counted as unemployed. 
because you get a severance benefit. And until that severance benefit runs out and you can file for unemployment, you're not counted as unemployed. So what the Fed's looking for isn't going to show up for six to nine months when all those benefits are out in spring to summer next year when we count the unemployed. And then it's too late. They'll put this thing in a ditch. So I really watched the Challenger Gray job cuts report. Here's a piece I did on the jobs report last Friday. Look, at we had over 5% wage inflation, 3.7% unemployment, declining labor participation, um, and 200 and, you know, 50, 60,000 jobs. This was not a jobs report the Fed likes at all. And so we'll get one more. They're only waiting on one more piece of data before next Wednesday, um, and that a week from tomorrow, and that's going to be CPI. And guess when it comes out? The first day of their meeting, December 13th. So the CPI, which I think is going to show inflation, energy prices have been going back up. Uh, the SPR releases are about done, which have brought the, the energy piece down. So I think we get a bad inflation report. And they put the bad inflation report with a strong jobs report. And I think the Fed gives us another 75 basis points on December 14th. And then they're going to give us six or seven more rate increases next year. Uh, I don't even think they'll begin cutting until 2024. Maybe they'll slow to 50 basis point increases or a 50 and a quarter and a 50 and a quarter. Um, but we're going to continue to see rate increases. So I think Jim Bullard's right. They're going to take this thing up to 7% on the overnight rate. So you add another 200 basis point on that for our funding. And are you ready for 8 9% mortgage rates on leverage? Um, and I don't think any of us are. And that's that's what we got to worry about coming in next year. So sorry, I just ruined Christmas for you. <laughs> so, yeah. So Casey, so that's very interesting. So you're saying all these uh, job cuts that's happening in Apple, Facebook, and that, that's becoming a big news. Uh, it's not really counted until the next six months because everybody's getting severance package. That's exactly right. And uh, wow. the media doesn't explain that. And so when the Fed, and the Fed knows this, so when they see these headline numbers that, well, we're still at 3.7% unemployment, they know that's not true. When you've got these kinds of job cuts coming, they and when I was at the Fed, I would brief him on things like Challenger Gray, and I would bring you know, the challenger great folks in to help brief the Fed. And, but they're academics and they don't get this stuff. But that's why I look at ADP, the private sector jobs. I look at challenger gray. I look at real industry data. Challenger gray is collecting every job cut. And what they're doing is it's kind of like PPI. What's happening in PPI inflation, that's the input into goods being made. And so if that number is running 8% plus, then guess what's going to happen on CPI? It's going to filter into that. Same thing with job cuts. If job cuts are running high, Eventually, they're going to filter in six months later into the uh, unemployment numbers when they actually show up and the severance benefit is gone. So people need to remember, you get a job cut, you're still being paid something, your health care is being continued. The government and the states don't count you as unemployed until all that's run its course. So that's like masking data, right? I mean, maybe they're not doing it intentionally, but so what's the impact of that data being masked off right now? I mean, in terms of Fed decision and just the industry itself, just on the commercial real estate. So if you were to count the challenger gray numbers and what's coming in those job cuts is unemployed, um, we'd be like a four and a quarter to four and a half percent unemployment right now. And that would be what the Fed wants to see to slow down. And they're not going to see it for six months later. So by the time that builds, they're really going to wait until we have, you know, a 5% plus unemployment rate when these job cuts get counted next spring or summer. And then they'll say, oh, my gosh, we should have stopped, you know, just like on transit, transitory inflation. Oh, don't worry about it. Oh, yeah, we were wrong. Forget we ever said transitory. They're going to be doing the same thing here on full, on a, uh, full employment. And that's what I scratch my head on is if you blew it on one of your two mandates, it's kind of like on a test. If you miss 50% of the questions, why go miss 100%? <laughs> At least you got 50% of them right. They want to blow up their second mandate. And how does that help the economy? And when you have both your mandates blown, you don't have full employment, and then you have still inflation, because this inflation isn't demand side. They could take these rates to 10 or 15%, and it's not going to bend the curve on inflation. This is supply chain driven. It's what we get from China. It's what we get from around the world. They can't fix that. We've got to remanufacture things here. And it's just like the 1970s. What happened is we made cars that were 70 feet in length that had no cup holders and got seven miles to the gallon. And it took us eight to 10 years to figure out how to make a car that was only seven feet in length with 70 cup holders that got 20 miles mm -hmm. a gallon. It took eight to 10 years of really destruction of the economy. And that's what I worry about on the supply chain. If we really don't fix the supply chain and understand that, we, we really destroy everything. And the Fed, Fed knows nothing about logistics and supply chain. I'll give you one statistic that'll just, that'll make the rest of the hair even on my hat here fall out. And that is the Atlanta Federal Reserve District, which runs from New Orleans all the way around to 
Port of Savannah in Georgia. They have more ports in their district than any other Fed district, even more than San Francisco. And guess how much research they do on ports and research? Zero. It's no wonder they don't understand supply chain. They have 22 ports that handle more supply chain than two LA and Long Beaches, and they study none of it. It's just absolutely insane. This is really, I get in trouble for saying this, but this really is in my opinion, and I worked in the Fed for five years with Bernanke. This is the most incompetent, bad Fed that we've had since World War II. They just don't understand. So is there anybody monitoring the Fed? I mean, they need to be reported to somewhere, somewhere, right? Or someone, right? Yeah, they're, they're pretty independent. They're independent from Congress, but they think they're another branch of government independent from the, okay. you know, the, the whatnot. And they, they think they can take on every burden and that they're in charge of it. And at some point, Congress has to, has to contain the Fed. I mean, this is our third central bank. People forget our first two central banks failed. And then over Christmas, they went to Jekyll Island and created this third central bank that was actually illegal. And, um, you know, they have a lot of power and authority and are unchecked by Congress. And we we learned that lesson during the great housing and financial crisis 2008 and 9. We did one audit. They did one audit on the Fed and their hair fell out. The number of Fed presidents that were acting inappropriately and investing wrong and, and whatnot was absolutely terrible. So the Fed's only been audited one time. And we really don't know as a country what the hell's going on in the Fed. So what you're saying is just because of the, I mean, what you're saying is Fed is making wrong decisions currently, right? Even though they know the data is, is, is going to get worse next year, I guess, right? Just because of yeah, all these wrong you decisions. Know, the, the people that really get it are what I call the interior Fed presence. Your Kansas City, Esther George, uh, St. Louis, Jim Board, your coastal ones, New York, Atlanta, San Francisco. They, they don't get any of this. And they're very political. And you look at the number of Fed presidents that have been you know, had to leave or retire because of inappropriate behavior and in, in, in financial affairs. They're, they're more concerned about padding their own pockets than they are actually, you know, doing their work um, at the central bank. So Atlanta Fed Bostic right now is under scrutiny for, you know, not doing his proper financial disclosures. And he's the second Atlanta Fed in a, in a row um, that, uh, that has had to retire or, uh, you know, or, or leave, you know, and then we had Dallas and we had, um, you know, Boston. And it's just, it's just ridiculous that we, we have these problems in our central bank. You know, we got to go back to your part of the world, Richard Fisher, the Dallas Fed. He was the only Fed president during the whole financial crisis that got a hundred percent perfect score when he was audited and all of his behaviors, funding his financial, their activities. Um, and, you know, then when you look at the interior feds like Cleveland, St. Louis, um, yeah, Kansas City, they're the ones that get it because that's the heartland of our country. You got to go inland that really understand what's going on. The rest of them, the coastal feds, I have no confidence in. Okay. So anyway, so that's the job stuff. So here's the CPI and PPI. And you see the CPI pull back, you know, a little bit under 8%. And everybody said, oh, see, inflation's peaked. And we look over at PPI and it's still 8%. And what we really don't get is the reason that we had this slowing in inflation over the late end of the summer was because of the petroleum releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, the Biden administration brought energy prices and gas down about a dollar a gallon. That masked the wage inflation, the food inflation, uh, the household inflation. And so when the SPR releases in the 180 million barrels, these inflation numbers go back, forget eight, try looking at nine, 10 or 11%. So uh, that's the real you know, thing I've got to look at. And then pay attention, the, the last piece of data the November CPI will get on December 13th, the first day of the Fed's two-day meeting next week. And I think that's the last piece that's going to tell them they got to go 75 basis points, that they, they can't take the foot off the accelerator. Um, the other one I put over there on the side, it's kind of interesting to show what a crazy world we're in. So as of today, the two-year treasury was at 4.3%. So why in the world would you leave any money in deposit at a bank that's paying you one and a half percent on your CDs <laughs> when you can go get a risk-free two-year treasury at 4.3%? Um, then look at the SOFA rate. This is the overnight funding rate that replaced LIBOR. And this is at 3.8%. It's more than a 10-year treasury. James, can you ever remember when LIBOR was above the 10-year treasury? This is insane type stuff. And, and the SOFA rate was only at 25 basis points six months ago. So uh, then you look at the 10 year at 350, which should be like 450 going to five. And then you look at a 30 year mortgage at six and a quarter percent. We are in very strange times. These challenge even what we knew from the 1970s. And this is why I say, you know, really our headwind is capital availability and the cost of capital going into next year. The fundamentals of our commercial real estate apartments, industrial 
are all very strong, but the capital is just being choked off or priced at levels that it's unsustainable. That's our big picture. So your number one thing is really working with your, um, with your clients, your funds, your investors in looking at understanding what does going from a three-year, 10-year 10, 10 treasury to a 10 or a SOFR from 25% to 3.8 affecting your construction loan, what does that mean for the cost and feasibility of new development? And that's what's going to slow the economy down pretty dramatically. So that's my, my big number one concern. Here's the SPR releases on slide seven. This is the administration's own director, Hochstein, showing that they've really, the 180 million uh, barrels, uh, the contracts have been let, they haven't all been funded. That's what's playing out right now. And by January, all this is gone. And we're done with the SPR. So that energy stuff comes back. We go back to, you know, a dollar a gallon more gasoline. Here's the gasoline prices. It's horrible news if you're on the West Coast. You're, you know, four and a half to five dollars a gallon, getting ready to go back to five, six, or seven dollars. And in the South, you know, from Texas all the way to Florida, we're under three dollars to about under 350. And so even if this moves 50 cents to a dollar, we're still going to be, you know, a dollar, dollar fifty better than the rest of the country. So for our regions, the, the the general South and some of the Midwest, we're going to perform much better than the rest of the country because of our our energy prices are are not going to hit us as hard, you know, with the wage and with the food and the and the shelter costs. So we're going to be able to absorb rent increases better in the South, from Texas to Florida, Tennessee, and the North Carolina. So this is good news for our part of the country. Bad news for other parts of the country. And this is my legacy inflation slide that I put together a year and a half ago that I think I've shared with you and your audience that showed really why I felt almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, that we were going to see a 1970s inflation event. So the, the blue line is inflation. The great areas are the, are the recessions around hyperinflation, World War II in the 1970s and early 1980s. And the key thing is there's three things that happen around every one of these hyperinflationary periods. And we haven't had one in 40 years. The first thing is you have massive deficit spending right before the inflation really kicks off. So in the 1970s, what caused it was funding the Vietnam War in the 1960s. Massive deficit spending. The deficit spending and fiscal stimulus we've had now is from COVID. You put $23 trillion extra in the economy and you're going to have inflation. The second thing that happens is you have an unforeseen market disruption. So in the 70s, it was the oil era embargo. Today, it was COVID. We, we, we should have seen a pandemic coming in our future, or, but none of us saw when it was going to occur and what happened in China. And so that's been our disruption. That's been our equivalent of the oil embargo of the 70s. And then the third thing is when it gets really bad, you get politicians doing really stupid things. So Nixon's was, I'll put price controls in effect and I'll solve inflation. Nobody can raise prices. Inflation solved. That didn't work out so well when they had to lift them. And the equivalent of that today is the Federal Reserve and its balance sheet. The Fed put everything on its balance sheet since 2008 and 9 that wouldn't clear the market. They ballooned it from around a trillion dollars when I was there in 2005. Up to 2010, we went to over four and a half trillion. And then we got that back below four trillion before COVID. And then they took it to nine trillion. And then Congress threw another 12, 13 trillion dollars at the economy. You can't do that and not have inflation. So that's what I saw a year and a half to two years ago. And that's what's playing out right now. And what we're going to see happen in 2023 is what we feared was going to happen in 2021. And in fact, 2021 turned out to be one of the best years we ever had in our, in our industry. And 2023 is going to turn out to be one of the worst since the 1980s. So there's my inflation thesis. And then the other thing I'd call your attention to that's really easy to follow, it's free, it's forward looking, is the uh, Crepe Index. Uh, this is something I co-produced with CCIM Tech and, and the site to do business about a year ago when we set out to identify 10 forward-looking metrics, and if we did the math and algorithms around it and we back-tested it, we would see something that's very predictive of recessions and recoveries. And that's, in fact, what we happen. So on the left, you can see our 10 forward-looking indices like University of Michigan Consumer Confidence all the way down to the Green Street Commercial Property Price Indices. It's got some housing, some economy, some employment, some commercial. It's not overweighted in any one area. And so what we saw is when we back tested it, the all time low is in March of 2009 at 84. We started this year off near really record highs of 91, 92. And everybody was asking me through the spring, why is it not correcting? And my answer was, look at what happened to the Fed. So uh, the Fed in January chickened out on doing a rate increase. They took a, a holiday in February. 
uh, to see what the groundhog was going to do. They came back in March and said, oh, there is inflation. Maybe we'll do a token quarter percent. And then we'll take another month off for spring break in April. They came back in May and said, well, we better do it a little bit more. So they threw 50 basis points at it. And then by the time we got to the summer, we saw we had runaway inflation. And so they've been doing 75 basis point increases ever since. That effect, those rate increases, really didn't start to affect things like consumer confidence, commercial property prices, job layoffs, really until the summer. And that's why we've seen this dramatic drop from 92 to the record low of 82 in July. And it's kind of plateaued there at, eight, at 83 right now because of the SPR releases. But that's, when those end, this thing goes back. And I think we see our CREPI index go below 80 in the first quarter of next year. So what I also do, you can see the link there at the bottom, site to do business.com forward slash CREPI. It's free, you can forward it. You can see the whole workbook and all of our math and it's, it's fully transparent. And then if you click on those uh, little button that says CREPI explained, I write a narrative every month on really what 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 happened here. So that that's a neat one that captures it all. It's really simple and intuitive for you know your investors and and uh, and, and your and your agents. Uh, if you don't get everything that I did here, some of you uh, might be familiar with EXP and whatnot. So I just did a podcast for them, and these are my four key points. We face a really challenging period ahead in 2023. So you know don't be scared, but keep getting prepared. Uh, if you're in the office area, pension funds, everybody, they're starting to dump the office assets. It's going to, here's my quote that you can follow. First one that ever said this. So remote work will do to office properties what e-commerce did to big box retail. It's going to be that bad and that long. This is going to be a five to 10 year process. Multifamily is going to be very strong. If you can't buy a home, the prices have doubled, the mortgage rates have doubled, the mortgage payment is doubled, you got to back up into multifamily. So even though we'll add a record number of what, James, about 480,000 apartment units this year, if you divide that you know, by the top 48 markets, it's 1,000 units, that's a rounding area of supply. Um, it's just, can you, can you continue to increase the rents? Uh, what will happen is I think your top class A um, renters will move down to B assets to afford to rent, but they'll keep renting. So I think the B assets and the value add improvements are gonna be very, very strong um, on the multifamily and there will yeah. be no soft landing. There's no soft landing here at all. So Casey, I think uh, you're talking about the crappy index, which is going really bad, right? Which in general, what you're saying is uh, 2023 is gonna be a bad year for commercial uh, real estate. Uh, but multifamily and industrial will be strong. You think so? It'll be stable, right? Is that what you're saying? Right. So industrial is still remaking our supply chain. What mm -hmm. you'll see is industrial, they're going to slow down on building half million to one million square foot um, e-commerce warehouses, kind of like what Amazon's done with overbuilding. So there'll be more smaller ones, 100 to 300,000. In multifamily, uh, it's going to be harder to get new construction done because the supply chain, but the slowdown in single family is, is helping ease that both on the costs and the materials, um, but your ability to, to grow the rents to keep pace with expenses. Expenses are growing at about three times rent growth. So that means your NOI is gonna go down. So your biggest friend in multifamily is gonna be your property management team. Where can they find the efficiencies, the cost savings uh, to, to bend the curve on those expenses? Um, and then the last thing is really what's the debt gonna cost you? Because we haven't even started, I've got a slide here on that in a minute, what is the effect of going from a 3% 10 year treasury to a five or six, seven, eight Fed increases? What does that do to the cap rate? If we go back to our appraisal 101 school classes of the banded investment and look at, you know, building up a cap rate from the cost of debt and the cost of equity, what we'll see today is it's almost impossible to justify a cap rate below seven and a half percent, where a year ago you could easily do it in the four and a half to five and a half range. So we haven't seen that piece come yet. Okay, yeah, that's 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 going to be an interesting slide. So let's go for that. Yeah, so here's the next six items. So the valuation, the CPI measures, volatility, and then really those that haven't seen the Emerging Trends 2023 report that ULI does. I was involved in the first one over a quarter century ago at Equitable. It is one of their best reports, and I encourage every investor, every one of your your clients and your audience to read that if they haven't. But let's go let's go through these. So here's the commercial property price index. This is the Green Street one, which is the institutional quality real estate, but CoStar has one, Real Capitalytics has one, and all of them are showing that values have peaked and they're coming down. And the reason they're coming down is that kind of yellow gold box I have in the middle is that if expenses are growing at three times the rate of NOI, you look at an apartment deal with a 35 to 40% expense ratio, and that's growing at three times your rent growth number, which is maybe 
you know, mid mid single digits to maybe some markets you've got are, are, are at a 10 rate, um, your NOI is going down. So even if you don't change the cap rate, you've got less NOI because expenses are not growing rent growth. So when you're, saying ex when you're saying expenses, are you talking about mortgage or are you talking about some other expenses? No, you're, you're, oper you're, you're operating insurance, taxes, maintenance, labor. Because of um, the inflation, right, what you're saying? Okay. That's right. Yeah, your maintenance and particularly maintenance and labor. You know, we're seeing, you know, uh, you know, everybody, you know, asking for 10 to 20 percent increases or they quit and go. So if you got a key, you know, maintenance engineer guy, he can almost name the price. You know, uh, at hotels, maids now are making more at Marriott than the uh, the back office or front office staff. And they're complaining and they're paying maids, you know, in, in Marriott and whatnot, like 50 to 60 thousand dollars a year. And when you talk to the head of Marriott, he's, he says to his uh is white collar staff that are doing things with computers and IT and reservations. He says, go, go be a maid. I can create an app for what you do, but I can't create an app to clean the room. <laughs> so that's, that's really the key there. So that's all we've seen right now is just the expense side affecting the valuation. But here's what concerns me. So one of our fellow CCIMs uh, put this, uh, put this thing together, Greg Hout, there's his email. He said, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can email him and he'll be glad to send this tool to you. But what he basically did is he went back and looked at January last year and said, okay, we're at 3% or less 10-year treasury. Banks will lend at 70, 75%. Uh, they don't care that much about debt service coverage. They were really happy. And you can see down there at the bottom with the red arrow, you know, you could justify a five to five and a half cap rate. Fast forward today, you're looking at a four and a half to five year 10 year treasury. Banks now only loan 60%. They want the loan less LTV. They want more debt service coverage. You filter that down and we're at a seven and three quarters cap rate. That's what has to play out next year. The market and the capital have to catch up the disconnect between buyers and sellers. Sellers still think that their assets are worth a five, five and a half cap rate. And buyers are saying, no way. If I got to put new debt in place and new capital in place here, I need to be in a seven and a half to eight. And that's what we have to see. We have a big disconnect on that. But this is this is the real story that's going to play out. What does this do to your valuations? And here's the thing to take solace in if you're an investor. Every new apartment project that you build is going to cost about 20% more than the last one. So look at replacement cost to have you feel good about the valuation uh, that you've got there. This is a time we're going to go back and look at replacement cost, principal substitution. We can't afford to build. So we're going to put more value on buying existing or value enhancement. Um, and this is the mitigate and banks forget it. The appraisers don't know how to do a cost approach anymore. I try to teach it to them, but they just don't, they don't get it. Um, so that's that story. I don't know if you want to pause on that, but this is the big headwind. It's not that fundamentals are going to be bad. It's not that demand's going to slow. It's not that we're going to see 5%. They can see go to 10%. Um, the problem is where, where is the capital? How do I access it and what does it cost me? And that's what's going to change the value. Yeah. So I think the key thing is in this is like whoever has um, you know floating rate debt, right? And they want to, they need to exit next week, next year, right? That's going to be a problem because now buyers are going to be asking at seven and a half cap, which you know, if if they have not created enough value or if we don't have enough cash flow versus whatever loan they have, it's going to be a problem, right? And they can't go into a fixed rate debt as well because even fixed rate debt, uh, I mean the the interest rate is high right now, right? For the ten year treasury, right? Slightly high. So that's a problem. If if somebody need to exit, I guess in the next twenty twenty three, I guess. Do you think it goes up to twenty twenty four as well? I do. And think about who's most vulnerable. It's that that guy building the new construction because he's mm. got a variable rate. He's got it probably tied to legacy LIBOR that's now SOFR. So it's floating and a SOFR that was at a quarter is now at 3.8. And then when he looked at his permanent debt, looking at an interest rate that's probably going to be six to eight and try to factor that in um, and what the what that does to the value, it's it's going to be hard. So I think the, the folks that are completing construction and need to go into permanent debt are going to feel the biggest squeeze. And, um, and then those that have good assets that maybe they want to get out of or 1031 out of, somebody coming into that has got to put new debt in place. It's going to be double the cost of that person exiting. So it's going to get really hard. Uh, you'll see in a minute, the number one uh, item identified by the ULI's emerging trends this year is that buyers and sellers are very far apart on, um, on, on pricing. And yeah. uh, that's, the big, that's the big challenge. And your skill as a broker or an agent is going to be helping that uh, seller understand what was 
isn't anymore. And if they really want to get out of an asset or trade out of an asset, they're going to have to get realistic on the price. And the and the buyer is saying, look, at, I, I just can't make the numbers work. I'm not going to do it. And then we won't have transactions. Yeah, the good thing is the construction project I showed you just now, I had a fixed rate diet on it. So that's awesome. See, for there, next, there, for were, next three years. <laughs> you were prepared. You didn't get scared. You got prepared. And that's, you know, I'm in a legacy Eagle Scout in our scouting days, and the number one thing we learned was be prepared. Be prepared and so yeah. you were you were smart. You were you were prepared. Yeah, I mean, the at that time, I think this was like five months ago. I was given an option: either you do eight hundred beeps plus sofa, which comes like ten percent, or you get a fixed fixed rate of eleven percent. And I said, okay, I'm going to fix it. I don't care. I'm, I I don't like any variables. So you were I took the fixed rate. Now it probably would be like thirteen percent, right? Thirteen forty yeah. percent right now. You're right. Yeah. So see, those investors ought to be very happy. You were you were thinking ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. You, you were a few you were a futurist and you didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't like uh, variable uh, variables in my projects. Yeah, you're smart. So that's that. So here's another thing I look at, and this is again how weird we are in time. So I look at the VIX, the Chicago Board of Equities Volatility Index, and when it goes above thirty, it, it, the market is telling us they're freaked out. And so when it's below 30, they're supposedly telling you, no, it's cool, no problem. Well, if you look back just, um, you know, uh, here in, uh, you know, going back to just, uh, you know, six, six or so months ago, not even six months ago, even in October, we had a VIX that was over 30. The market was freaked out. Um, and so now it's down below 20. The market should be incredibly freaked out when you look at the market, look at the rate increases, look at the pending recession. So I don't, I don't understand it. This is the first time I've seen the VIX not perform like it is because it used to be a very reliable indicator of, of risk. Um, so I, I may have this one wrong or I have to rethink it. There's a lot of things we're going to have to rethink. But I used to follow the VIX pretty closely. It's not telling us what we, uh, what, what we should know. Um, another one, you may have a lot of investors or agents that are involved in other parts of the West, the Colorado River Basin State. So Colorado, Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, New Mexico, Nevada, and California. Well, what happened is this past year, the Bureau of Land uh, Reclamation and the federal courts told those seven states, except California, that come January 1, they have to cut their water consumption by one third. That means no, no, no new building permits, no new housing permits, no new manufacturing, no more new site selection. So if you're in Las Vegas or you're in Phoenix or you're Denver, um, you know, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, you have some real headwinds on the water issue and economic development that you need to be thinking about. And just imagine if you woke up in your city tomorrow and they told you on January 2, you can only flush the toilet once every three times. <laughs> uh, and, and you got to cut your water and you can't water your grass and you can only run your dishwasher and washing machine on every third day. Um, and, and what that means to your economy. And it's not just water, it's electricity. And we're facing a point in February where Lake Powell and Lake Mead will not be able to allow water to flow over the dam to run the hydroelectric uh, uh, generators, which means 80 percent of the electricity that goes into Las Vegas is off. So you could be looking at rolling blackouts in Las Vegas and Phoenix. So this is a very, very serious issue. And I tell people right now, you better be paying attention in these Colorado River Basin states because this is a long-term multi-year problem. And you know, if you have a multifamily asset, it may become very valuable because you can't build any new stuff, but you may have to spend a lot of capital to implement water saving measures. You know, the low flow toilets, if you haven't done those, you may have to completely take out most of your landscaping. It's big changes. You better be paying attention. And this, this piece here is a very lengthy, thorough piece of what's coming up at the meetings this month where they have to implement these one third water reductions. So it's, it's a big deal. So if you're in those states, um, pray, uh, you know, you know, do sun, water dances, you know, go back to of gun smoke and all the Western movies when they did rain dances. Uh, we, we may need a, a lot of that and a lot of snowpack this winter. 